Welcome, my name is Marcelo Gleiser, and I am the director of the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary uh, Engagement here at Dartmouth. I call it the good ice. That's why you see a little aura on top of the ice here, because there are other ices around, and it's bad competition. So I just want to make very clear, we have no affiliation with the other ice, you know. Um, but, uh, and we promote all sorts of events um, trying to bring the sciences and the humanities into what we, I call constructive engagement, right? And a lot of these events are here on campus. Some of them are outside. So for example, tomorrow we're going to New York and we're gonna have one event there at the 92nd uh, Street Y with Rebecca Goldstein and Alan Lightman talk about the nature of faith. And everything that we do is videotaped sometimes live streamed which, or, and sometimes just videotaped. So if you happen not to see something, you can always go to our archive on this uh, website there. And we have over 50 hours of videos already archived with uh, talks, interviews, conferences, on all sorts of big questions. For example, the nature of consciousness, the nature of reality, the mystery of time is coming in, in, the, in the winter. And we're going to have um, different conversations about artificial intelligence and the future of humanity. So these things are ongoing and uh, we're going to go at least until June 2019 um, and hopefully longer depending on funding. We'll see how that goes, right? But um, so one of the things that we do have here is the Fellows Program, right? And the Fellows Program is somewhat, if you're familiar with the Montgomery Fellows, it's somewhat similar where we invite people who are wonderful people in their fields to spend some time here giving lectures, visiting classes, talking to students, to colleagues on their fields of expertise. And right now we are incredibly honored to have Professor Tony Aveni here with us until I think November 3rd. And Tony is a force of nature. I don't know exactly how else to describe him. Incredibly active and involved in many, many different things. You know, this is his public lecture. There's gonna be also a more somewhat specific seminar on more astronomical aspects. Soon there'll be a workshop with the colleagues from anthropology. So, and he's gonna be visiting houses while he's here. It's quite amazing. So um, let me tell you a little bit about Tony before we uh, move on. Um, and I am going to read because I don't wanna miss anything. <clears throat> so, so Tony Aveni is the Russell Colgate Distinguished University Professor of Astronomy, Anthropology, and Native American Studies. Now this is exactly why he's here. I mean, you don't know many people that combine these three things, you know, under one title. At, uh, the and with appointments at the Department of Physics and Astronomy and Sociology and Anthropology at Colgate University, right, where he has been since 63. So he is one of the pioneers of the field of archaeoastronomy and is considered one of the founders of Mesoamerican archaeoastronomy, in particular for his research in the astronomical history of the Mayan Indians of ancient Mexico. So if you remember when the world was supposed to end in 2012, he was the guy that sorted it out and put everybody to rest and said, look, don't worry, it's not going, this is not how you read this stuff. Um, maybe he'll tell us something about, I know, here we are, right? Um, he is a lecturer, speaker, and editor of three dozen books and author, of course, of three dozen books of ancient astronomy. And he's lectured on many different related subjects to astronomy at cruise lines, which is actually a great gig. I've done a few of those, they're awesome. And uh, let me also mention before he starts that he just published this book called In the Shadow of the Moon, which is a wonderful kind of a first person narrative, many parts of it, of the science, the magic, and the mystery of solar eclipses. So if you have not seen one, there's another one coming in 2024, and honestly, it's not to be missed. It's a life-changing, I think, visceral experience that you should not spend looking at a camera. You know, you should look at what you can see in the sun directly, I think. That's my own opinion, you know. Anyway, so Tony is going to tell us about the sublime, sublime science of eclipses for the humanist, which I think is a wonderful title. So Tony, please.
Thank you, Marcelo, for your generous invitation. Uh, Lorraine and I are in love with Hanover, and thanks also in large measure to Amy Flock, an assistant director. Your ice is the coolest. Um, special thanks to my mentor. I'm like a college freshman. Deb Nichols, she's my mentor while I'm here, and um, can't thank her enough for her hospitality, and, 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 and John as well. And especially to Colgate alums, going all the way back to 1899. A couple, <laughs> few of you managed to attend, so I'm truly grateful. Uh, my talk today is distilled from the vapors of that American experience that happened at the end of the summer, uh, and will happen again. Uh, less than seven years from now, and look at where the path of totality goes, right through the northern parts of the states of Vermont and New Hampshire. It'll be total in Burlington, not quite total here. Hanover always seems to miss out on these things, as you'll see a little later in the talk. So there's another good reason, then, for talking about eclipses. And so today, what I'm going to do is to walk you along the narrow ridge between two steep slopes. Some say slippery slopes. On the one side, uh, the objective scientific way to look at eclipses. And on the other side, a more humanistic way, uh, which has to do with the emotions and the expressions that we have. And you'll see that even the hard-nosed scientist is capable of using that adjective that I chose to italicize at the top of this talk, the title, the word sublime, which comes up over and over again. The problem really is a problem of language. How do you express to someone something that you've experienced, in this case seen, that they haven't seen? And I even see an analogy in the horrible disaster in Las Vegas. I listened carefully to people trying to describe what they experienced, and they had to struggle to get the words, to think of the language. Uh, and it's not so different when you view an eclipse. I mean, of course, it comes from a totally different realm, but you can't describe uh, what that is to someone who hasn't seen it. You sort of have to be there, have to have been there. Well, there were some 80 million Americans who were there to witness the first total eclipse to cross the continent in 99 years, and then again in seven years. What's going on? Why is Carbondale getting two total eclipses in seven years? Jerusalem hasn't had one in 1,100 years. There's a topic for the religion seminar, I think. You start with the twilight that's visible all around you. It's not like the twilight that you see in one direction. It's visible all around you. And then the sharp shadows as the image of the sun narrows down to a thin crescent. The expression on people's faces have been described as ghastly a ghastly looking expression, and the shadow of the nose against the face, a sharp shadow, and you look at your friends and neighbors that you might think you've known for years, like I've known Lorraine for over 60 years, and the face looks different. It's a different countenance that you see. And then you see the sun go through the phases of the moon. It imitates the, the phases of the moon in reverse. Uh, and then as the crescents narrow down, the temperature drops, and then you get the wind picking up, animals scurry around, uh, the crescent uh, images you can see in between the trees as the wind picks up, the skin cools, and then the wind blows in the trees and you see, you see thousands of tiny shimmering images of the sun between the spaces between the leaves on the trees. And then out of the, out of the west comes a dark blanket over your head. And there are pictures of my students in 72. We were up in Nova Scotia to witness total eclipse. And they're pointing to the wave of darkening that comes from the west as the sun begins to become totally immersed in the shadow. Uh, the words that people use to describe, well, I've got words. I've looked up the words of people who try to describe this. I did quite a lot of research trying to find people who could say this eloquently. And one person who did was a Smith College student by the name of Rebecca Jocelyn, who in 1905 writes this description of what you're seeing in, the, in those slides. In Spain, when she witnessed that eclipse, we hardly had time to draw a breath when suddenly we were enveloped from the West by a palpable presence that held us paralyzed and breathless in its grasp. Not bad for undergraduate writing, huh? then shook us loose and leaped over the city with incredible speed and disappeared in the east. 
And seized with a superstitious terror, we gasped. What was that? That was the shadow of the moon. And then you see shadow bands, ripples on light surfaces, looking like the ripples you see at the bottom of a swimming pool after you've just left it on a sunny day. And then Bailey's beads, so-called. This is the light of the sun coming through the valleys on the edge of the moon. And you can see that uh, as the moon covers the sun, you get the prominences, those red flashes occurring at the end. And the last flash, the diamond ring, the last jewel on the chain of beads, as astronomer Bailey would have called it, that expression having been devised in no other place than the Big Apple in the eclipse of 1925. They called it the diamond ring effect, which you expect on Madison Avenue. Uh, and there you see that last flash, and then the descent into totality. and Everything gets dark uh, as the uh, corona becomes visible with its streamers uh, flashing way, way out beyond the rim of the, uh, the sun. Here's how Mabel Loomis Todd described it, 1889 eclipse in Yokohama. It's a problem to find the words. She said it beautifully. This is the wife of David Peck Todd, Amherst professor of astronomy, who missed uh, totality on nine occasions before he finally hit it in Yokohama. He missed it because of clouds and a whole bunch of other reasons. It's another lecture. Here's what Mabel said. As the world holds its breath out upon the darkness flashes the glory of the incomprehensible corona. A silvery, soft, unearthly light with radiant streamers stretching millions of miles into space. While the rosy, flaming protuberances, that word went out of date, means prominences on the edge of the sun, skirt the black rim of the sun in ethereal splendor. Of course, this was the Romantic period, but people wrote these things really so beautifully. Ethereal splendor, says Mabel. And... Uh, so say other people about this splendor. James Fenimore Cooper, who witnessed the total eclipse, the great American total eclipse. It was another one of those eclipses coast to coast. 1806 was the year. It was total in Cooperstown, New York. Not total in Hanover, Hanover total in Manchester. You see what I mean? You're, we're missing out here. You have to go north or south. But it was just a short buggy ride to get down there in those days. And it'll be a short walk to go up to Burlington, I suppose, in, or a short drive in just six years. Here's what Fenimore Cooper says. All faces turned upward. Then an exclamation of delight, almost triumphant, burst involuntarily from the lips of all. The grand spectacle, the vision, almost unearthly in its sublime dignity, was suddenly revealed to us. Mark Twain uses the same word. He features uh, his own emotions in Connecticut Yankee in King's Art and King Arthur's Court. And here's a passionate statement that he makes. With a common impulse, the multitude slowly rose up and stared at the sky. I followed their eyes as my life went boiling through my veins. As the rim of the black sun, uh, as the rim of black spread slowly onto the sun's disk, my heart beat faster and harder. When it got dark, I was struck with one of the grandest attitudes with my arm stretched up, pointing to the sun. It was a noble effect. And then the stars and the planets come out. And that all the uh, visual experiences I've had, that's one of the grandest. Uh, people will argue about, is that Mars? Is it Venus? Don't worry about what it is, as Marcello said. Just look at it. Just gaze at it. Just gawk at it. Uh, and there uh, come the, the, uh, the stars and the planets. And we stretch our imagination trying to describe the color. I have a long list of colors uh, used to describe the corona. They can't all possibly agree. Among them are topaz, peach, Sulfur, metallic gray, ruddy brown. People can't agree on what the color of the corona is. President John Quincy Adams tweeted out a sonnet, 14 line sonnet. Looks a little blur to me, but, uh, uh, but he tweets that out. Uh, a lot of people don't know. Uh, Quincy Adams, of course, lost the election to Jackson. You may know that, American history. Uh, but also did more to promote the cause of science than practically any other president, maybe save one, whom I'll mention next. 
he went to Congress and argued that we must attain intellectual independence from Europe. Intellectual independence from Europe. Of course, America was regarded as a backward country in those days. Uh, and I remember sending this, this tweet and a few other comments in a blog I did the, the day we had the March for Science on Washington, you may remember last year. I love the little uh, statement at the end of this news sheet in which it was published. Evidently, there were some infrastructure problems in DC, as we expect an epic poem from the late president, from the now uh, ex-president, on the frequent eclipses of the sun by the dust of Pennsylvania Avenue. Pennsylvania Avenue was not paved. Shame on him for not taking care of in infrastructure. Of course, Jefferson was another one. He, he's one for two on total eclipses. He missed the, the 1778 because it was cloudy. But in 1811, he was there. Uh, and Jefferson actually used the telescope to time the contact periods of the eclipses. Can you imagine a president of the United States indulging in such activity? Then he writes a long letter to David Rittenhouse, astronomer of Philadelphia, complaining about the inferior timepieces that we have in America. We've got to stop relying on the, on the Brits and the Germans for these important uh, pieces of equipment. Well, you can see in this famous quote here, uh, he, he declares that he should have been a scientist, could have been a scientist, but then, of course, you know, he ended up committing himself to the boisterous ocean of political passions. Wouldn't it be if, uh, wonderful if more office holders would commit themselves to studying science and, uh, you know, follow their passion? Other presidents who have viewed eclipses include your very own in Vermont, uh, Calvin Coolidge, who witnessed partial eclipse in D.C. On, uh, in 1925, cold January day, January 24th. Uh, there's Mrs. Coolidge in the background. And his dog, he tried to get his dog to look through the smoked glass. And he held the dog in the glass. And then the dog uh, had nothing to do with it. And there you see the dog escaping from the scene. And there's another president looking at an eclipse. Uh, I would say that you can add eclipses to the list of things for which this person might not be qualified, depending on your persuasion. Uh, the first lady shown in an unorthodox passive pose. I searched all over the internet to find pictures of people that looked as if they had had a sublime experience. This is one of the best ones I could come up with. I mean, he is just witnessing the sublime. Uh, and where does that word come from? Well, it's Edmund Burke, philosopher Edmund Burke, uh, defined it as a way of looking at nature that begins in fear and changes to a feeling of awe, verging on a religious experience. Now, you might say, well, of course, we scientists don't. We know what causes an eclipse. How many times have we heard this? I come from that realm. We know what causes an eclipse, so there's nothing to get all prickly about. Uh, yet, Warren De La Rue, British astronomer, first to make a photograph of uh, the wet plate photograph of the solar corona, more eclipse expeditions than anybody at the time, wrote this, this is the 1860 eclipse in, in, uh, in Spain, he wrote this about the experience. Only a few brief seconds, unfortunately, could be spared from the telescope after totality had actually commenced. But when I had once turned my eyes on the moon and circled by the glorious corona, then on the novel and grand spectacle presented by the surrounding landscape, and had taken a hurried look at the wonderful appearance of the heavens, so unlike anything I'd ever witnessed, I was so completely enthralled that I had to exercise the utmost self-control to tear myself away from a scene at once so impressive and magnificent. And it was with a feeling of regret that I turned aside to resume my self-imposed duties. But I vowed that if a future opportunity ever presented itself for my observing a total solar eclipse, I would give up all idea of making astronomical observations and devote myself to the full enjoyment of the spectacle, which can only be obtained by the mere gazer, by the mere gazer. So that was good advice, Marcelo. You know, don't put down the telescope. Look, look at it. This is what I tell my students. I remember one of my students on one of these trips, we've done eight, we're eight for eight, so we're very lucky, uh, and I remember a young woman taking her glasses off, uh, her, her shades off, and tears streaming down her face. And she said, you know, Professor, you may have explained the science, the science of the eclipse, that's all well and good, but to me it was a miracle. 
to me, it was a miracle. And she was weeping. So you see the walking that fine ridge between the personal, the more human, humane, humanistic way of thinking uh, and the scientific way. I'm saying maybe they're not so far apart. If, if Warren De La Rue can get all excited about it, uh, well, then anybody can. By the way, that quote was one sentence. That was one single sentence that I quoted. So people used long sentences in those days. They hadn't invented the semicolon. Of course, then it all happens in reverse. Everything goes backwards. Uh, and you see uh, Bailey's beads all over again and the shadow bands. And it's so exciting. Uh, how can you keep up with it? Uh, you, you get very nervous about it. And then, of course, then it's over. Uh, and daylight comes, and you want to go home. Uh, so that's the end of it. Uh, the rest of my talk, I'm going to deal with how people uh, in other cultures react to the eclipse. And I'm going to give you a special treat at the end and, and a special invitation at the end. This is to keep people awake now. You have to have pay off uh, a special invitation to do something at the end um, and uh, take you to the Maya ruins to show you a recent discovery uh, that was made by a number of Maya people, Maya uh, enthusiasts. And I'll tell you all about that. So that's where we're headed. We're headed for the anthropological realm. But I have to stop at the animal realm, which is in between. I only found in my research a single published paper in the biological journals that had to do with animals' reactions to eclipses. Uh, and it came from observations made in Lebanon, New Hampshire, 1932. I'm not tailoring this lecture just for local interest here. It happens that there was a team of biologists from Harvard uh, that came up to Lebanon, and they set up all of these uh, uh, observations of different animals. And I think, as you can see, one of them was the bee, the beehives, because as you may know, bees use uh, to navigate the angle between the sun and the feeding source. And then when they come back, the angle between the feeding source, the nest, the hive, as, as it were, and the sun. So they are expert navigators. And I'll just read you a little passage, again, here, not too much to struggle for words, because these are scientists. But I'll just read to you what happened as totality began to take place. Starts at 85 degrees. This is the month of June. Uh, the temperature drops 15 degrees. And he describes the, the, the bees, the honeybees coming back to the hive. At 4.30, the period of the greatest darkness. The front of the hives were covered with bees, all trying to get in at once. All trying to get in at once. At 4.40, a few stragglers came in, those caught in the dark a long way from home. At 4.45, there was not a bee in sight. You're getting the passion and emotion going on here. Um, uh, then uh, not a sound in the apri apiary except the hum in the hives that is usually heard at night when the ear is held close to the hive. There was no outside activity, all apparently arriving at home. Uh, so it becomes literally night in the daytime. That interruption of the day-night cycle happens almost in an instant, and even the bees react to it. One biologist writes about zooplankton, microscopic uh, critters that live in the sea in layers, and talks about how, as totality advances, the layer of zooplankton rises slowly. And then at the end of totality, it goes back down. So it's like the, like the uh, I, I think of the image of raising one's hand to point to the sun, which is also depicted uh, in the uh, eclipse that took place in Atlanta, 1984 um, annular eclipse of the sun, the ring left around it. At the regional primate center, they described the movement of chimps going up and down. There's a, a typical archetypal chimp uh, going up and down. And then finally, as totality, as it came closer to totality, it wasn't total, they would bear their chests to the sun and go up and bear their faces to the sun. And there's a report of one chimp gesturing, just like Mark Twain, gesturing with his hand at the sun, reaching for the sun. And I've seen people do that. I've seen people on eclipse strips that actually put their hand up as if they want to touch the sun. Uh, one anthropological study I know is done in India. Uh, uh, other than that, nothing. Uh, well, who's going to study people when there's a total eclipse? I mean, you want to see the eclipse. You don't want to talk to what's going on in your head while you're seeing the eclipse. But there are some really interesting stories about eclipses that I think tend to get passed off by we Westerners. I don't mean cowboys. I mean Westerners. You know what I mean. As mere superstition. I love the word mere because superstition, of course, the very word means above the status quo, outside the status quo. So if you think in normative terms, this is something that we don't cotton to, but maybe other people do. 
the, the images most associated with the occurrence of eclipses, whether they're superstitious or not, uh, are making noise and biting, biting or eating. Uh, and here is a romantic drawing of a passage from Garcilaso de la Vega, a chronicler of the Inca. Indian people were said during a total eclipse to whip their dogs, to make them howl, sorry for animal cruelty, um, and bang the drums and make noise. And Garcilaso says that this is a silly superstition to chase away demons. Much later, anthropologists who ask the Indian people about what they do with this making noise are told, we're not really chasing demons. We are trying to get the sun's attention. There you see the moon, who is the ruler of the night, whispering in his ear. Can you see him whispering in his ear? He's telling the sun, who rules the day, untruths about how we people behave at night. And we're just trying to get his attention to tell him that these are lies. <laughs> Therefore, the whole business of making noise is to call attention to a ritual which might promote a discussion of the evils of lying. This is far from what we call superstition. And couldn't we use a discussion like that, maybe? You know, what the evils of lying? Everybody, you're lying, everything is fake. So maybe we can take a tip from this so-called superstition in quotation marks, which isn't surprising or superstitious at all. Here is Rahu, the Hindu demon, eating the sun. I will not go into this, because I have to have some reason for you to buy my book, but I do talk about the, the Indian version of the myth. But we do see this eating and biting uh, almost universally. Here we are at the Temple of Quetzalcoatl at the ruins of Xochicalco, Mexico, and you see my blue arrow pointing to the disc, the daytime sun, in the jaws of the serpent, the feathered serpent Quetzalcoatl, who's devouring the image of the sun. Gary Gosen, the anthropologist, wrote a wonderful book called Chamula and the World of the Sun, published about 25 years ago, uh, in which he interviewed people and talked to uh, people in Chamula, which is in Chiapas, Mexico, one of the, uh, one of the Maya cities, contemporary Maya. Uh, and in the middle of the interview, one of his informants asked him, uh, asked him, do you people bite each other in America? Do you bite each other or eat each other? And, and Gary turned around and responded and said, of course not. We don't bite each other. Why? Do your people bite each other? And the respondent said, yes, well, they don't. we don't anymore, but they say that in the ancient times, uh, we used to. Here he was referring to cannibalism, which, which was a, uh, actually largely promoted by the conquerors as a, as a, a Maya custom. And he said, we don't do this anymore, but they say in the old days, and our ancestors who lived in the distant past did that. And after Gary talked to him for a while, he realized that this person's attitude, the Maya attitude, is such that the farther away you live in space, the farther you come from, come from America very far away, the farther back you are in time. So there's a really time-space relation. So Einstein wasn't the first person to suggest that time and space are related. Uh, uh, with, with, I'm not saying the Maya had the theory of relativity, which would be fake news. And somebody will say, you know, he said that, I didn't say that. Uh, but the idea is that um, if Americans live on the outer fringes of the universe, then they must also live the outer fringes of the past, and they would then be able to tell what went on. We Chamula, he says, we've civilized ourselves by creating social rules, in so many words, that eliminate uh, the cannibalism from the contemporary space-time, but maybe deviant behavior occurs far out in the universe. And, so, and we want to know it because we are the people who are in charge of maintaining order and stability in the universe, and so we have to know if there's any uh, harm that might come to us from the cosmos out there. So I think this is a good example uh, of this biting on the one hand and making noise on the other that we tend to overlook as a superstitious belief from another culture that means nothing. The important point is what did it mean to them? In this case, these are again reminders about the necessity of discussing the evils that live in the cosmos or that live in the environment so we can restore order. This was also the case a thousand years before uh, Gosen ever wrote his book. Uh, for the Maya, of course, in the ancient times, uh, ruled by dynasties, knowledge is power. Uh, and the closer tabs that you have on eclipses, 
uh, and any other occurrence that takes place in the natural world, uh, why the better to certify your legitimacy to rule, because you're the one that knows, that has all this knowledge. So the idea of knowledge is power, power vested in the ruler who guarantees a uh, perpetual balanced universe. Uh, and so uh, therefore there are rituals of sacrifice and debt payment. We have to know when to pay our debt to the deities, and that's what so much of the Maya literature is, is really all about. I think I envy these people because they lived in a participatory universe. Uh, I don't have a plan to stop the Big Bang or halt evolution. Well, maybe the AI people do, but, uh, but these people really have this notion that they're part of this thing. You know, there's a dialogue, there's a deal that goes on with the, with the gods, and we have to do our part and they do their parts, reciprocity. We know that in the highest echelons of the Maya, the rulers had scribes, and here you see uh, um, from a Maya vase, one of them uh, engaged in writing a book. You can see the stylus and you can see the stack of books, books made out of the bark of the ficus tree called misnamed codices. Uh, that, that they were elite, there is no doubt. You see the jaguar throne or cushion behind this scribe, who is very much a part of the elite class. Uh, uh, there were excavations in Copan some years ago of a scribe replete with his pots and fragments of things he worked on adjacent to the tomb of the Maya king. So these people were quite elevated. Bishop Landa, the first bishop of Yucatan, says when he comes over with the conquistadors, we found among these people a number of books, but as they contain little more than the lies of the devil, we burned them all. And then he goes on and says, well, which they grieved, but who cares if it's full of the lies of the devil? Well, the remains of three, maybe four, there's a big debate about whether the fourth one's a fake, survive, and one of them, called the Dresden Codex, after the city in Germany where it now resides, having been discovered in a janitor's trash heap about 200, 180 years ago, is about eclipses. And here you see, I brought a replica of my, not the authentic one, but a replica of it. The authentic one is sealed in glass in Dresden, and you have to go crazy to get to see it. But here you see uh, the dragon. Uh, the, I don't want to call him a dragon, because I'll, I'll be arrested for that. He's a feathered serpent. I dare say dragon, they didn't have dragons. But there is the feathered serpent devouring the symbol of day night, the sun. You see the crescent moon, the dark side and the light side. And he is devouring the sun and next to him are these strange notations. And you see these dots and the bars. So a one minute lesson on Maya math. The dots are ones, the bars are fives. I think they undoubtedly come from having counted on the fingers. One, two, three, four and the tips of the fingers become the dots, and then five becomes the hand, which can be held out like that, so we, uh, writing being gestural before it was in the form of what we would call uh, writing. Uh, and so these numbers then uh, are base 20, that's the other thing I have to tell you, it means ones, 20s, 400s, 8,000s. Ones, 20s, 20 times 20s, 20 times 20s, that's when you count stuff, like if you're counting cacao pods, one 20s, 40s, 8,000s, when you count time, the third place becomes 360. So you have ones, 20s, 360s, 18 times 20, 18 times 20, and then 20 times 18 times 20, and so on. So to be a sharp kid in Maya math, you had to learn your tables. I mean, they're very different tables. I think it's interesting that uh, they kept time by this other system, ones, 20s, 360s. You might say, well, why do they do that? We do the same thing. The conclusion of this hour, I'll be done long before then, don't worry. 559, the next minute will not be 560, and then 561, it will be 600. And that's because the Babylonians d devised the sexagesimal system. Uh, and I won't go into detail, but it's got to do with the length of the year being uh, approximated by 360, where we get our degrees from. For the Maya, if you have a number in the third place up, you could say, well, it's that many, roughly that many years and change in the lower numbers. So this number. Three bars, two dots, I know we're on vacation now, so I won't make you participate at this point, uh, would be 5, 10, 15, 18, uh, 17. Yeah, that's a 17, so that's 17 ones. The number on top, the order is straight from the top to the bottom, is 8 20s. 8 times 20 plus 17 times 1 is 177. You can do that in your head. 177, 177. The third number is a bar and three dots, that's 8, 8 ones, 720s, 148. 177, 177, 148, 177, 177 numbers, 177s and 148s, 
covering several pages of this document, the Dresden Codex. 177 is six months. In Espanol, seis meses. In English, a semester. Your semester is very messed up. I mean, it should be six months. Everybody knows that. A half a year. The Babylonians divide a semester. So did the Maya. Six months. And then the 148, this number that pops up once in a while, five months. So you have strings of six months, five months, six months, a lot of six months, and a five month. A lot of six months, and a five month. Usually about seven, six or seven semesters, followed by a short semester. I call it a short semester, 148, five months. So to decode the rhythm of eclipses, as you'll see, because the short lesson in eclipse science is about to descend on you, you have to know how to tune in to the 6-5 beat, to the 6-5 beat. How many sixes and how many fives? How many 177s and 148s do you juggle together to be able to get sequence of eclipses? And that takes us then to a quick, very quick course. And I don't know if this is going to, oh yeah, I think it's going to work this time. We all know, I have to resort to the Western way of knowing that, of course, the moon goes around the Earth, the Earth goes around the sun. Maya didn't care about this. That's all Greek. It's totally a Greek fabrication. It comes from geometry. Very convenient, very abstract. And you can see, because the sun happens, the moon just happens to cover the sun perfectly, only place it happens in the solar system, you get a fine pencil point, maybe 100 miles wide, give or take, that scratches its line over the Earth's surface and will do that in Vermont, New Hampshire in 2024. And there you see the path totality could take place. You imagine a little a line, a very fine line scratched over the surface of the Earth. That's the shadow of the moon. Now, you would think that you're going to get eclipses every month because it takes the, well, from our perspective, it takes the sun a year to go around the zodiac. What's your sign? A year to go around the zodiac. It takes the moon a month. So every month, the moon should get in front of the sun, should get an eclipse, right? Not right. It turns out that the pads are inclined. The moon doesn't move exactly in the zodiac. They're slightly inclined. So it's only when the sun and the moon meet at the juncture of these two pads, and there are two junctures, you can see, one on one side and one on the other, that you can get an eclipse. That's every six months, except that the line between these two orbits that connects them slowly regresses to meet the moon and the sun as they enter that zone. Therefore, once in a while, you can sneak in an eclipse at five months instead of having to wait for six. So that's our abstract geometric way of explaining. <laughs> we don't know the Maya way of explaining it. It was done numerologically. But that's our way of understanding how it works. We will be right at that point in 2024. If you travel up to Burlington, of course, the people around in the stipple zone will be like all you lazy slugs who didn't decide to drive down to Carolina or go somewhere else. Show of hands, how many saw totality in 2017? Well, that's, that's pretty good. But the rest of you, you know, you're, you're going to have it easier in 2024. But uh, yeah, so therefore, I mean, we know, our way of explaining is that we know that you're going to get eclipses every six months and maybe once in a while in five months. Seven six-month periods and a five-month. That's 47 months, 7 times 6 plus 5. Or 6 semesters plus 5 months, that's 41. 47 months, 41 months. So you got to juggle the 47s and 41s to get eclipses. And as you go a long period of time, that, that gets hard to do and get to do with any accuracy. I now take you to the ruins of Shultun, Guatemala, for the latest news on a Maya discovery made in 2010, not by a famous archaeologist, but by a graduate student who was sent out on a mission. I think Bill Saturno, who was the archaeologist at Boston University, who did the excavation, wanted to get rid of the guy. He said, go out and look at some looter's mounds and walk around. And the student walked over this mound in the suburban area of the ruins of Shultun, northeast Guatemala in the Maya rainforest, classic period site, 8th century. You know this, can't make up the story. He kicks a stone, rolls over, dark hole. I'll romanticize it for you, cold air blowing up. I, I, I didn't hear about the smell of the air. Uh, but in any event, flashlight down, painting, paintings, painting flex, paint flex. And this, the National Geographic picture of what he saw. It was a room 
in a suburban building where there were guys, I'll give away the punchline because it might be getting drowsy. Uh, it was a workshop, and they were making book in there. Making book. They weren't betting on the Dodgers or the Red Sox. They were making books, Maya books. And it was Bill Saturno, shown here in a rather intimidating posture, holding his hammer close to the painting. I, I told Bill that I didn't think that was a good picture to advertise archaeology because it looks like you're going to smash that painting. But he was the one who excavated this building. Uh, and uh, working with him was MacArthur genius Heather Hurst, who did this reconstructed drawing of the inside of that building. Now, all of this takes a long time to excavate and to do the drawing. It shows from the hieroglyphs what has been interpreted as a group of Tah, T-A-A-J, which means obsidian. We'll call them obsidian guys, the order of obsidian scribes. They are elite scribes. That's why they're painted black. They're not black skinned, but they are covered with lamp black to, sim sim to signify that they are members of the obsidian clan. They're dressed in their depends, and they have around their neck, younger people didn't get that, they're dressed in their depends, <laughs> the laughter, and um, they are wearing, uh, you'll know what they are someday, uh, they're wearing pendants, they're wearing stucco pendants around their neck, and they have stu stucco pendants on their hats, and they have just done some, some very hard work, these scribes, uh, with their books, uh, with their calculations. And here, a representative of that group, he has the same medallion around his neck, uh, bringing the results to what only can be described as the ruler. I mean, just check out the headdress. He has to be the ruler. Very important guy. Uh, and the glyphs tell us, only partially deciphered, that they are arranging for a ritual to be conducted on some important occasion that probably has to do with something that went on in the sky. And I'll show you, I think it does. Uh, and that is being celebrated on this tiny room Smaller, I'm going to say about the size of from here to that door to that edge right there. That no bigger than that. Tiny little room. These guys are in there doing this. Uh, and there are on that wall, when it was being reconstructed, some texts. Um, Bill calls them microtext, a tiny little dot and bar text, very fine writing, including one here and some others. And it was at this point that I became interested, or at least I was invited. Bill called me up, and he said, Tony, we've got something very interesting here that you will, you will find very interesting. So we'll talk about what it is. Sent me the information. I did not get to go down there. Now, the place has now been buried and left intact because, you know, for looting, looting purposes to try to avoid the looters. Here's the text, and it's the only one I'll talk about. There are more texts there. And it's uh, been restored, deciphered by David Stewart, the epigrapher. Uh, there you see the restored version on the bottom. There is all that you can see at the top, uh, a long sequence of dots and bars. And if you read the first one, we, we're not going to do the math, don't worry. But David quickly realized that if you take the last one and subtract the next to the last, you get 177. And so he said, aha, what would I get if I subtracted 177 from the next to the last? And the answer is, well, something that's consistent with the remains in the third column from the right. You can see partial dots and bars. And so on and so on all the way across. This is a multiplication table, of sem a semester multiplication table. 27 semesters, 162 months. Multiplication table. What would anybody want with a multiplication table of 177s? Well, if you were doing computations of how many 177s you have to have, how many semesters you have to have before you institute a short semester, it might be really convenient to have a multiplication table handy. So here is Dave's reduced version of that table. The first multiple, 177. Two times 177. Three times 177. No time to tell you about the glyphs or anything else. But these are the numbers that we see in the Dresden Codex, written 800 years later. So this bookmaking that Landa talks about, the lies of the devil and all that, some of this stuff has to have been going on at least from the 8th century. So there are the numbers, 817, 817, and so on. These are the cumulatives. So as you take a number here, you take a number on the top and add the one on the bottom. This is a long, long table. I've, I have it replicated here. You get this number on the top. You add the one on the bottom. You get this number on the top. 
You add the next one, you get the number on the top. So they're accumulating long intervals. 405 months is the length of the cycle. 11,960 days, about 33 years, give or take, um, of eclipses. This number caught my eye. It's very interesting, and people have known about it for a long time. 1855 translated 6,585. It appears incidentally as a cumulative in a long chain that goes on for several pages. The Babylonians knew 6585 as the Saros, Babylonian word for repetition, which they thought was the ultimate eclipse cycle, 223 months. It's a seasonal eclipse cycle, 18.03 years, which means if you get an eclipse, like the one in 2017, you'll get another eclipse 18 years later that will be in the same, almost on the same day, very close to the same day, and another 18 years later again. And if you triple the Saros, three Saroses, the eclipse comes back to the same place on Earth because the 6585, if you do the calculation, really is 6585 and a third of a day. There's a third left over. So you got to go through three rotations of the Earth, three cycles, to get the eclipse come back to the same place. So I've devised a family relationship among eclipses. There's the daddy of the 2017 eclipse, which happened 18 years ago but wasn't, didn't occur around here. Then there's the granddaddy, which is two Saroses ago. But the great granddad, those of you who have grandparents you love and appreciate or did appreciate, would be glad to know that it's the great grandparent that is the most like the one you see today. And the great grandparent of the 2017 eclipse that we just witnessed was the eclipse that happened on May 16th, 1963. It's the year I came to Colgate, but that's not why it occurred. Uh, uh, 1963, um, which was total. Not exactly the same track as 2017, slightly farther north. It went through Maine instead of South Carolina. Featured in a novel by Stephen King. And in the third season, sixth episode of Mad Men. So you've got to look, look up all this stuff. That was the granddaddy of the eclipse we just saw. So it's kind of fun to work them out. So now stay tuned as I culminate with the most important slide in my lecture, and I know you're going to, I won't bore you with this, I promise. I'll try not to. The lesson here is something that you don't often hear about in science. Cultural diversity in science. Cultural diversity in science. Let me explain why. I've already suggested to you that you have to tune into the 6-5 beat to be able to see when eclipses recur. And that the way to do it, the best way to do it, is to take these semesters in sixes and sevens, which is what you see in this document. Uh, and uh, that uh, allows you to insert a short semester. So you have 41-month and 47-month intervals. You've got to juggle these 41, 47-month intervals. Babylonians chose to take two of the 41-month intervals and three of the 47, which combined to make the Saros. Why did they do it? They were interested in predicting seasonal eclipses. Got to occur at the same time of the year. Identical eclipses. They've got to have the same totality. That was their, that's their question. I want to devise a way to answer those questions. How do I get those eclipses? The Maya didn't care about that. They were just as good at observing. They had tabulations that go on for years and years. I read Time Magazine last week. It said that they just found evidence that the zero was in use in 228 AD. The Maya had it 300 years before, but they're not mentioned, interestingly enough. Here's what the Maya did. They chose three of the 41, along with six of the 47, to get 405 months, which is 11,960 within hours, within a couple of hours, 11,960. You might say, well, why did they choose? Why did they want that cycle? The answer is, this is the punchline for cultural diversity, they were interested in cycles that commensurated or resonated with the mother of all numbers, 260 days, which is the number of fingers and toes on the human body multiplied by the number of layers of heaven. This will really turn scientists off. <laughs> and the gestation period of the human female. And the gestation period of the human female. That's what you have to have. You have to have a cycle that envelops all of those things. That's what they care about. So they didn't care about the same stuff that we did yet. They still compiled huge amounts of observations and records. They didn't use technology. 
Uh, so you can start arguing about who's better. I don't think I want to do that. I just want to say that this is a diverse way of doing science, a different way. It's interesting, the length of that codex, 11,960 days, beats in the rhythm of 5 to 2 with the length of the micro text deciphered by David Stewart. It's a 5-2 beat with that text. So that must have been important. The text, by the way, is this big. It's written very fine dot and bar. And it fits exactly the column of cumulatives in the Dresden. It fits perfectly. So these guys must have been practicing the writing on the wall because it was about to go into a book. So they, they probably had to learn how to write it very small. And there is somebody preparing the book. You try to imagine this. They're putting the stucco on it. Another one is drying. They're getting ready to give that to the scribe who's going to put this very fine text. So the art of uh, writing, consisting then of making very tiny little texts that fit. And it's only one of several texts. I'm blessing you by not talking about it, but I will give you a commercial announcement We're coming up now at the end that will suggest to you that there's a way you can learn more about it. There are some more of these. Franco Rossi uh, did a wonderful dissertation for Bill. He had the notion to dig under the floor of 10K2, Shultun, the name of that building, because it had been suggested and documented in some other cases that people are often buried very close to where they do important stuff. So he dug beneath the floor. There he found the remains of two males and a female, I believe. They had the stucco discs buried there, the very discs that were worn around the neck. Here you see his drawing. These are the scribes, astronomers, if you will, buried under the place where they work. So think about where you work. Are you, is there room under the observatory for the astronomer to be buried? And so what was going on here? Well, I don't doubt that these students of astronomy witnessed the sublime. They probably couldn't find the Maya words for it in their syllabic language. But here's a pot vase, my last slide, from central Guatemala, provenience unknown. It was probably looted. I like to call it the astronomer's pot or the astronomer's scribe's pot. And I think it gives a pretty accurate description of what I believe was going on in that room where that microtext was written. There you have the trusty old professor. He has no teeth. No, he's the scribe, old guy. And the words coming out of his mouth, there are the hieroglyphs. I love this. And here's the other guy. Look at the numbers. He's got his pen in his hand. There's the book right there. He's got his stylus, and he's spouting off these numbers. Look at the students. There's this guy, raptly focused on, you know, just as in all of our classes, raptly focused on the material that's being told. So is this student. But then, as all good teachers and experienced teachers would know, for every one of those, there will be a guy like that who's gazing off into the distance saying, I can't wait for this to be over so I can hieroglyphically text my roommate. Before I thank you for your indulgence, commercial announcements are in order. I acknowledge my colleagues who did much more work on this than I ever did. Um, and of course, you can buy this book. It's now $19 on Amazon. You, can, you wait a couple of months, you can get a used copy for three cents. And it's also for sale online. And here's my special commercial announcement. On Saturday, we are bringing Heather Hurst here. She is coming with the drawings, the latest drawings. There's some infrared uh, evidence from photography being added to that. She will come to the stated place and lay out the drawings. We're going to have an interactive workshop. People are, well, it's not going to be just a straight lecture. It's going to be an inter interactive workshop. She's going to bring these here. Uh, we call it viewing Maya murals excavation through interdisciplinary eyes. Heather is an artist and anthropologist. Franco Rossi is the guy who did the excavation, so he's the digger. He will join us from Germany via Skype. So he cannot be here, uh, but he is a very dazzling lecturer, and I know he will interest you in uh, his title. is something to do with how young people were educated to become scribes, so that ought to be interesting. And then I will take a little bit of time, not a lot, to talk about the other numbers that are there, including some numbers that are so big they go beyond the age of the universe, according to the Maya. So we don't know all what's going on with everything. But I want to invite you all to that event, which is sponsored by the coolest ice and the best anthro people in the world. So thank you for coming.
Thank you, Tony, for this wonderful lecture. I mean, told you he was a force of nature. There he is. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. I'll have to give you the mic because we're videotaping this so that it's all being registered, OK? But please don't be shy. Richard Kramer from History. Well, thank you very much. Um, I wondered if you could say something about the Maya view of the eclipses. If they were keeping track of the 47s and the 41s, they were presumably predicting when they were going to happen again. And they might have had the sublime responses, but were there also concerns about the political implications or the meaning of this in some cosmic or some social sense that uh, would make the society be very worried about when the next one was going to appear? Well, yes, there certainly was a concern about any natural phenomenon that takes place. And with the Maya, it's all detailed in the book, in the books, uh, where it tells the rites that you have to perform. And usually the glyphs that interpret what's going to happen will have an omen attached. And very often it can be an omen of war, an omen of instability. Uh, and unless you do your job and make the offering at the proper time, and here, of course, politics are a part of it. You have to politicize the eclipse. Of course you do. Uh, there would have been a lot of stress placed on the ruler and consequently on the scribes who worked in his domain. The sad part of this history, since so much was destroyed, is we don't know very much about the relationship among these people in the polity. Uh, we only know the scribes were of high standing. They were doing their work. Clearly, they had a long time base. We go all the way back to La Mojada, Steel III, uh, and, and, and um, Steel II, I guess, uh, 200 BC, 250 BC. And we have information in there about watching Venus, about eclipses, and so on. It would take some hundreds of years to get that data, to get enough data to realize that these eclipses occur cyclically. Certainly, they must have started with the moon, because when a moon eclipse occurs, same kinds of periods as the sun, but when the moon, occur, when moon eclipse occurs, uh, half the world sees it. More than half, because the world turns uh, and sees the eclipse. Uh, half, more than half the world can see it. Uh, and they must have realized at some point in time, as we think they did in the old world, that, uh, well, they operate on the same pattern here. I mean, it's clear that the eclipses of the sun fit the same kind of periodicity. So probably three, four, five hundred years. And the more widespread they were, we think there's little doubt that the Maya were in cahoots with the Teotihuacanos on the other side of Mexico. And they shared this information. They certainly talked about these things. So you'd have a whole part of a continent where you'd be collecting this data. But yeah, it would be hell to pay if you didn't get it right. There's a wonderful tale from Chinese uh, history about uh, two uh, astronomers, uh, Ho and Hai were their names. Uh, their fate is sad, though visible, reads their epitaph, being hanged, for they could not spy the eclipse, which was invisible. They screwed up the prediction, lost their heads. A demanding job, no doubt. A lot more demanding than academia. <laughs> which is why the Chinese always over-predicted eclipses, because they wanted to make sure. Yes, and, and, and that's a good point, because the Maya, I have to say also, the Maya were more interested in eclipse warnings than they were in predicting exactly when will the eclipse occur. They were interested in the, the danger periods. Uh, that was what they were trying to predict. And so I'm glad you mentioned that. It's not, a, not about getting the, the exact date and the percentage of totality. These are Western notions. Uh, thank you. I hope not a stupid question. How accurate were these calculations? Well, I and, can tell and, you, uh, we don't know from the eclipse table how accurate they were because we're not clear about the, the way they're arranged. But we do know an ancillary table right next to it, which is the Venus table in the Dresden Codex, predicts the heliacal rising of Venus. That is to say, the first appearance in the morning sky after Venus is blocked by the sun. The mean interval when the Venus is blocked by the sun is eight days. And the number eight is the first number in that table, after which Venus reappears. If you take that table, which has been thoroughly deciphered, the eclipse table not, thoroughly deciphered, you find that it's accurate to one day in 500 years. 
they can reckon the period of Venus, 583.92 days, round it off to 584, but they have a correction table. And there is a correction, well, I won't be able to show it. You can come up here and I can show it to you. There's a correction table to the eclipse table. But one of the problems with the eclipse table is people can't agree on whether it's a lunar eclipse table or a solar eclipse table. So work has to be done. But we know they were very accurate with Venus. Anybody else? So are there other cultures around the world that took this quantitative interest in eclipses? Well, that's a great question for, the, you know, for the, the, those who discuss these things in the Institute. The Chinese certainly did. Problem with the Chinese record, it's enveloped in bureaucracy. Uh, it's buried in, in bureaucratic literature. And not a lot of people have had access to that material. But there's enough access to know that they were certainly predicting eclipses by the first millennium BC with some degree of accuracy. Babylonians doing it by 600, 500 BC. And that gets passed on to the Greeks and so on. So no question in China. And then, of course, in Mesoamerica, there has been some suggestion that the Aztecs were doing this too. I'm not totally convinced, although there are many references in the Aztec chronicles, of course, who didn't have writing, so that's another problem, that they certainly were recording them. They recorded a lot of them. But when it comes to the predicting, you've got to get into the workshop. And why I'm so excited, I'm so excited about discoveries, is that's where these they're geeks. They're eclipse geeks, and they're working on this stuff. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I, I was chilled when I heard uh, Bill Saturno tell me that they even found marks on the stucco wall where you could see the scribe was leaning to do the writing, must have been shifting his back back and forth, and the sweat uh, accumulated and rubbed the stucco off. Uh, and he must have had to have his back washed when he was done. So you know, there were people in there working. Uh, on that. And that's what's so rare, because we always see the finished product. You know, We see the, the Greek document that comes down from Aristotle or whatever, translated, so it's even farther out of context. This is so exciting, because these were the guys who were doing the, the dirty work. They were, they were working their, their hearts out. So yeah, it's a good question to, to ask. Anybody else? OK, so let's uh, take one more. Oh, there's oh, one sorry. more. Oh, OK. <laughs> i just curious, when you were talking about those scribes, whether there was some indication of how they met their deaths. I, I wondered if they were you know, gloriously sacrificed for their wonderful work. <laughs> well, I'm not an archaeologist, but Franco is going to tell us on Saturday. I think that you can see some evidence that, that uh, they, well, at least there is a plate put over the head. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not, well, not, I've got very good archaeologists in the hall, and I'm not going to interpret that. Um, I don't know. I don't know, but, but Franco has worked more on this now. He has work coming out on it, but I don't know if there's any evidence they were sacrificed or anything like that. They didn't do much with human sacrifice over in the Maya territory, I think. That's... Good. On that uplifting note, uh, I'd like to thank you for coming, and hopefully you'll come back on Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.